Well, good day, everybody. Welcome to the Lifetime Talks training podcast, and I'm excited to bring you back the one and only Dr. Dr. Gary Gray. And, you know, if you haven't heard of Gary, I mean, there isn't a person out in the industry educating that hasn't probably learned something, took something from Gary. He's, you know, longtime friend and just an amazing man and, and, a, and a, just a influence to the industry is, is second to none. So I can't welcome him enough. And I'm excited today to really deep dive into movement analysis, movement assessment. Um, there's so many different ones out there and we're going to talk about the pros and cons and going to talk about what we're, what, what's happening in, in his development as well. So welcome to the show, Gary. Jason, thanks so much. Uh, best thing about your introduction is, uh, the idea of the blessing of our friendship. So yep. I, I really appreciate that. And, uh, it's uh, it's been fun to learn from you, and it's been fun to constantly share. And you're just doing an amazing job with these, uh, you know, lifetime uh, training talks. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. And and that's you know one of the, one of the big things, Gary, too, is just working with people. And you know, obviously, we'll get into some of you know what that means and in that behavioral side. And and so often, you know, when we talk about assessments, it's like it becomes analysis paralysis at, at some mm -hmm. point, you know, in some cases, or, you know, a lot of times the, the trainers trying to cue and they're cueing 8 million things and telling them what to do, as opposed to just, let me see what you like, just do this. And, and so obviously how we communicate through assessment has a big influence on what we get and, you know, the inputs versus the output. So why don't we start, you know, obviously you, you have a doctor in physical therapy. You've been in that world forever, working with the best athletes in the world. Um, over your tenure, can we talk about the history of, you know, this assessment, what was learned kind of through school and kind of what you learned growing through and how it kind of morphed into the fitness industry to get to, you know, hopefully where we're going, you know, in the future. Yeah, I think that's important. Um, because I think we've all been on a very similar journey, whether we do rehab or whether we do performance training or whether we do prevention, you know, anytime we're dealing with the human being and trying to get them to move better. Um, I think we've all, at least the people that I talk to, have gone through the, a, a similar uh, journey where we, we start kind of learning from the books and they kind of tell us to look at joints in isolation and lay people down and, you know, do this manual muscle test and do this range of motion test. And, you know, and that's kind of how I got started <laughs> over 45 years ago. Uh, but then we quickly realized the body was connected and realized we had to come up with uh, an ability to say, how does the foot influence the hip and how does that influence the shoulder and how do we put it all together? And then of course we know it's three dimensional and initially it was like, I'm not sure we can do that. Uh, it's easier to just throw them on the table and just look at one thing at a time. And, and uh, but that's not how the body functions. And therefore we had to kind of progress along this journey to, well, okay, now, now what do we do? And we got to the point where we did a lot of evaluation in what we called transformational zones. So um, I had the wonderful opportunity to uh, share time with you on the golf course. And by the way, you're extremely good golfer. And I still remember that last hole you whipped me on. But just for an example, if I get into the transformational zone of golf uh, on my backswing and on my follow through, well, we know there's a combination of movements. We know what the muscles are doing. We know what the proprioceptors are doing. So we would spend most of our time assessing that, which makes sense if you're going to assess me as a golfer. Same thing if I'm running or walking, same thing if I'm swinging uh, a tennis racket, same thing if I'm throwing, same thing if I'm picking things off the floor, same things if I'm working in the factory. So we really we kind of went to a journey where we said, well, let the person tell us what they're doing. And then based on that, we'll put them in the transformational zones of what they do. And we'll assess them three-dimensionally integrated chain reaction from there. But then, and even against what I intuitively thought, I, I didn't think we could come up with a, what I would call a fundamental foundational uh, movement screen for all of movement. In fact, if you would ask me eight, nine years ago, I would have said, I, I don't think so. But then we started challenging ourselves and found out that there were really uh, six primary transformational zones that serve as the foundation for all of human movement. And once we found that, it was like, well, okay, that's Eureka, uh, because it m matched everything that we wanted to match relative to the truth of function. It was sim six simple movements. Uh, more importantly, it gave us an opportunity to uplift and encourage the client in front of us. And just like you said, step back, 
and just watch the body move and their body will tell us where to take them from there. So our journey has been, I think, a, a very typical journey of uh, just about any move of profession. Well, and I think one of the things you said early on, too, is learning. And, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about learning from me, who you know, with, with the experience that you have. So that, I can't thank you enough, but that, that's the gratitude that comes in this. But And thank you for that. But when we look at some of the more common assessments that have been used, you know, you threw terms out like transformational zone and 3D and things like that. And mm -hmm. I want to deep dive into that because from what I'm understanding and what you're saying is that a lot of assessments that we've done in the past are done either lying on a table or they're done, you know, with a single joint action. And we're not looking at the transformational zone. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I'll have you explain what that means in a second, or we're not really moving the way that we normally move. So can, can you talk just a little bit about stepping back before we get into, you know, what you guys created, uh, but talk about like, where did it go? Like, why are people doing this? I mean, I know we've had conversation about the isokinetic machine back in the day and how we use that to assess. Some people have never heard of that stuff. Would, would you mind just talking about some of that stuff? So I think it, it gives people some type of uh, perspective on why you've created it the way that you've created it. Sure. Um, and like you say, it's been it's been a journey of learning from from so many people um, and taking advantage of the multitude of truths that are out there. And like I said, early on, I was trained to, you know, lay somebody down and have them lift, lift their leg up to identify, you know, either hamstring tightness or opposite side hip flexor tightness or, and even when we did it, we intuitively go, when are you ever going to do this? This is not a, a, a movement that we do in normal activity. We don't lay on our back and just lift our leg up. Um, and so the question would be, first of all, it's not movement. Next question would be, is it functional for anything? And the answer is no. Uh, the more we learn about how joints move and proprioceptors, our nerves work and, and basically how muscles react, the more we realize we had to mimic the exact movement that the person wants to be able to do in order to understand how they do it. Uh, so back in the Nautilus day and back in the Cybex day, they tried to con us and saying, well, if you isolate a joint in a certain plane of motion that you're going to get the muscle stronger, um, and we, we found out very quickly uh, that that's not true. In fact, just the opposite. Uh, we trained the muscle improperly. Uh, we did it isolated. So the muscle really didn't talk to the joints that's really supposed to talk to. We didn't train the nervous system, which we're now believing is probably the most important part of human movement. Uh, and so we kind of started, had to challenge ourselves and saying, um, you know, if we're just doing some isolated stuff or the shoulder or the back or the knee or the foot or, you know, laying down of the hip or, you know, getting on all fours or just trying to, we have to step back and go, is that a component of movement that they will do during their daily life? And the answer is no. So it became quite simple. It's like, well, what, what is the science of daily movement? What is, what is, what do I need to know? What, and we were, I think, blessed because we didn't come up with our movement assessment until we made 40 years of mistakes, um, which I think is a big blessing. Yeah. And at that time, we got the ability to step back and go, well, if we're going to do a movement assessment, first of all, it's got to be functional. Next of all, it's got to be movement. And most importantly, it's got to engage the patient so they immediately know, hey, I'm doing what I normally do throughout the day. Usually lay somebody down on their back and ask them to crack, contract their abdominals and have them to lower their leg. And you call that a core test. Even that human being laying there going, I don't think this reminds me of anything. Uh, seems very artificial. It's not what I do. It's not how I hit a golf ball. Um, and so. Would uh, you mind? So, so right there, like, I think there's a good, like hitting the golf ball is a, a perfect example. So sure. obviously a, a lower abdominal test that's been used, you know, very often is to see how long, you know, straight leg, how, how far can they lower before their back arches, right? And, and exactly. testing that. And, and so what you're saying is, you know, that test, how does that relate to now bringing in some of the things you talk about, if you wouldn't mind me even showing, you know, in sure. the golf swing, what is a transformational zone and, and how do the abs work with the chain reaction and, um, to be able to explain that to somebody? Because I, I, we've been talking about some of these tests that people might know, but they probably don't know what 
some of the stuff that you've taught. And so right. would you mind, you know, going through and maybe showing us an example? Actually, I think that's a great idea because sometimes we just jibber jabber and kind of assume everybody's been on the same journey. But I think stop slowing down and just showing that if you don't mind, I'm just going to pop out of my chair. Yeah, perfect. And then move back a little bit and tell me, tell me if you can see me. But one of the easiest transformational zones to learn and understand is jumping. Uh, when I jump, I don't just go up. I go into a zone where I transition from a object that's falling towards the earth to an object that leaves the earth. And so that zone of function, my ankle dorsal flexing, my knee flexing, my hip flexing, my trunk flexing, I'm also going through transverse plane motion. I'm also going through frontal plane motion in order to let gravity load all my joints in order to turn on my proprioceptor. So all those muscles decelerate me, slow me down from falling, and now I can jump. And so that would be a transformational zone. So get right there. Uh, I want to, I want to, if you, you don't mind. Oh, please. Because in a squat, most people are going to look at that and say it's a sagittal plane motion, but what they're not mm -hmm. seeing is, is what joint by joint is happening in the internal rotation, even though you're, you're trying to limit the amount of internal rotation, but the amount of internal rotation, the amount of hip flexion, dorsiflexion, and all of those things that are going on, there is movement or movement that's being checked, so to speak, um, throughout that. So it, normal tests aren't looking at that. And then more importantly, they're not looking at the transition from going from a descent with gravity to against gravity. I don't think you can say it better than that. Perfect. So we find out everything is that walking is collapsing, regirding, and then taking another step and collapsing again. So, okay, there's transformational zones in walking. You brought up an easy one to see golf. I'm allowed to hold my club here and put it right behind the ball and just try to hit it. I'm not going to get much club head velocity. Ball's not going to go very far. Um, but I might be a little more accurate, may not go two fairways over. But if I, even a, even a, 15 month old kid will take a little plastic club and they'll take it back and they're taking it back where into a transformational zone. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to transform my body from going that way to now going that way. And so you said it best in jumping from a descent to an accent up in the air. And so the reason we do that is when we do this, we move joints, joints turn on proprioceptors proprioceptors then turn on muscles subconsciously. And so if I wanted to test in this case, my abdominals for golf, you said it best. Well, what do the abdominals do in golf? Well, this is very easy to see. As I take my hands back, the abdominals get lengthened in the transverse plane, huge lengthening in the transverse plane where my pelvis is moving and my trunk is moving. So hmm, that doesn't happen when I'm laying on the ground. So we're 0 for 1 right now. Also, when I take the club back, what's really good is great golfers will get some extension through that thoracic spine. So now I'm extending through the thoracic spine and I'm getting extension of the abdominal. So I'm lengthening it and I'm eccentrically facilitating a reaction in the sagittal plane. And then what's really cool is that when I take my club back, I'm getting lateral flexion to the left top down, but I'm getting a little bit of lateral flexion to the right bottom up. So I'm getting two types of frontal plane motion that again, turns on the abdominals my abdominals would say hey thanks you're now lengthening me in three planes of motion and once i am excited about the proprioceptors i then can then contract and go the opposite direction in order to hit the ball so if you just look at extension lateral flexion rotation in the same direction with the trunk moving and the pelvis moving in an upright posture and compare that to laying on our back with gravity now perpendicular now to the body, which really negates everything the abdominals is going to do, consciously, concentrically holding the abdominals and bringing the leg down, well, golf in the abdominals is here, and what we just described laying on the ground is over there. So there's huge <laughs> gap posts, yep. and so does that mean that's bad? No, that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it has absolutely nothing to do with golf. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a reason you want to lay on your back and contract your abdominals and lower your leg and have your pelvis not tilt. And then that's probably a pretty good test, but for golf or for any other functional activity, you hit the, you hit the nail right on the head. The real question is what does it really do in that transformational zone? And then how do we use that transformational zone 
in order then to assess the movement. So I have a good idea here. The cool thing about most movement is we have at least two transformational zones uh, where I, I load and I explode. And then I come here and I'm loading again. All my joints are now going the other way, but now I'm going through extension, lateral flexion, rotation the other way. Now my abdominals got to decelerate this motion in this transformational zone so I can come back to stability and hopefully see my ball down the fairway. So the abdominals would say, I don't do anything like laying on my back, <laughs> concentric contracting. So they would scratch their head and go, why are we doing this as a test? And, and the only answer we have is, well, we did it 45 years ago traditionally and nobody really challenged it. And so now, of course, as you know, at Grand Institute, a lot of times what we try to do is re respectively challenge not the mistakes other people have made, the mistakes I've made. So people, mm -hmm. don't, people don't realize all these mistakes I've made. So it's not like, no, 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 I can't believe you're doing it. It's like, no, 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 Gary, uh, you're a dingling, but I don't want to be a dingling anymore. So, yep. or less of a dingling. Let's well, and, and, and it's so funny too, because so many movements, well, well lack thereof, so many, so many assessments in movement assessments don't require movement. They, they require you to get to a certain spot. <laughs> right. But it, it, again, it's not, it, it, can I get to that spot? Yeah, there's a limitation. You're probably inflexible, you know, for whatever reason, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're not going to still go into this swing and, and assess how to fix things within the movement. So Beautiful. it's so, so powerful. So Gary, I, I think what's important now is because I think some people are starting hopefully to see now, uh, if they're watching this, obviously it's much better than if you're just listening. Uh, but they're, they're seeing some of the stuff and going maybe hmm in one it's powerful and i'd love for you to just speak on this before we dive into kind of the functional movement spectrum mm -hmm. is how do you deal with that right because <laughs> you know people have have spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars probably lost thousands and thousands of dollars when you look at no clients going to a weekend workshop you know learning this blah 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 now you're basically saying eh, those assessments not really the best movement assessments, you know? So what would you say to somebody like that? Well, first of all, I would compliment them on, on learning something. Yeah. Um, I would compliment them on the desire to want to be the best. Uh, I would start out by encouraging them to say, uh, you're on the right track because you really can't design a good program. As a personal trainer, I can't have a good program design unless I know how Jason moves, unless I know Susie moves, unless I know how, I need to know how they move. Uh, every program should be a little bit different based on how you move and what you want to do. Um, and so it's, it's real easy because you first of all start out with that's kind of what we knew a long time ago. And now we've learned a lot more, at least, at least we have at the Gray Institute. Um, and now that we know what function is, undeniably, we can, we can present to anybody in the world and say, science says this is function and no one can argue with this because it's It'd be as silly as arguing against gravity because that's part of function has to understand <laughs> gravity. So now that we understand what, what true function is, um, we're able to then say, well, the criteria for your movement screen must have this, not a suggestion, not from Gary, not from Gray Institute, not from, but from scientists, biomechanists, movement scientists would say, if you want a movement screen, strangely enough, you probably should be moving. <laughs> so yeah. you said it best. I mean, how can you have a movement screen if you're not moving? And then how can it be a functional movement screen if it's not functional? Yeah. So, but again, the, the, the people who like, for instance, immediately go, I think he's telling me that he's going to teach me something entirely different. And that's true. I wish I could say it blends. Sometimes I do teach things that blend beautifully with what you're already doing. Uh, and that's easy because it's just saying, Hey, you're already doing great. Uh, but I think intuitively anybody that's done some of the traditional um, assessments that I've done throughout my life, you know, on all fours and grabbing a plastic stick and laying on our back and lifting our leg up or stepping over something or not trying to move or hold ourselves real still or a long reach sit test or make our arm go internal external rotation. We, we know that's not functional. That's not what we do as we do it and demonstrate it to the client. It's like, well, I hope they're falling for this because I'm not. And, you know, so, but I don't know better. And what we want to bring to the movement world uh, is pure function, yep. uh, pure science, not, not our opinion. And what I hope, you know, one of the, the goals of the podcast is obviously to challenge, 
you know, if it, I always exactly. lived, lived real early, I got lucky enough to have not only a mentor, but just to have in my mindset is, you know, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know <laughs> and be okay with that. And, and right. for those out there that might be going, you know, maybe they shut it off already. Hopefully you didn't shut it off. You continue to listen and, and we'll get into some <laughs> more of the science, but you know, be okay with being wrong and, or be okay with how, trying to evaluate and, and move forward. That's part of this thing. And I can't tell you how many times I've been wrong. I mean, it's funny too, because in, in, when you were showing your golf early on and, and you know, I'm, I'm learning some of this as we, you know, are going through this podcast, but I used to do a, uh, an assessment and I had this Marine and it was a golf assessment. It was a movement, you know, more kind of joint by joint assessment that I did back in the day. And I didn't have any way to explain what you just explained. And when I told him that I thought his shoulder problem is more of a pelvic problem and, and, and his abs might have a play in that, he walked out of my session. One, he told me I'm nuts. I didn't know what the hell I was talking about and that he walked out of the session. And, and I, didn't, I didn't even have a time to, to stop him, but he just kind of had that mentality. So he's like, you mean to tell me that my shoulder hurts because of my abs? I'm like, yes. And, and he walked out of the session. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, anyone out there, I just want to kind of close this out. You know, challenge yourself. You know, be open and, and listen because that, this, is, this is some powerful stuff. So why don't we, you know, obviously if you use the term truce uh, quite a bit. And I believe that what we're going to talk about next with regards to the functional movement spectrums and the component of what consists, what functional movement consists of, uh, I think is going to open a lot of people's eyes and, and kind of bring sense to this. So um, yeah. I'm going to change it and I'm going to put it up on the screen here. Yeah, and I'll, I'll sneak over to mine so I can follow along, but I'll point out exactly what they're seeing on the screen. Um, yeah. But, but another thing, you know, sometimes when somebody's listened to a podcast, it's like, hey, Gary's Gary, Gary's kind of um, is somewhat negative about this particular group or this particular group of tests. And sometimes I think it's just best to get both opinions on the same podcast. Um, uh, I'm, I'm this podcast. To do that. <laughs> yeah, that, your podcast. I think I think, you know, if somebody's out there going, well, that's hogwash. Well, straighten me out because. I, I've, I've taught a lot of hogwash in 45 years. And the only way I know it's hogwash is if somebody gets online and says, or comes to my seminar or is kind enough to call me or even write a nice email and say, Gary, what you're teaching is hogwash. And I, I challenge it. And I look at it and believe it or not, sometimes it's hogwash, uh, but that's the only way I can learn. So I think, um, uh, <laughs> I just tell you a quick, quick, cute story. Um, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk uh, when we first came up with 3D maps, and it was obvious the one person in the front left row out of 200 people here had just been certified in uh, a different uh, movement screen that they call functional. And she wanted to just beat me up, you know, but she was kind enough to come up afterwards and tell me that uh, she didn't say kindly, you're full of hogwash, but I can't believe that you would challenge what I just learned. And I said, well, I try to challenge what I learn all the time. And she says, but what you're, what you're saying is everything that I learned is not functional and it's not movement and therefore it's not a functional screen for movement. And I go, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what I just said. I said, I didn't degrade anybody. I said, the people who came up with that are my heroes and are their heroes in the, in, in the movement industry and have, have helped more people than I'll probably help in my entire life. So let's make sure we differentiate between, I don't agree with the test, but uh, I admire the people who are behind it. Uh, and it uh, didn't fly, but I, I did ask her if she would come to the lab because th that way she could actually sense it, move it. She goes, absolutely not. But uh, she must have had a change of heart because after lunch, she came to the lab. I saw her in the back and it was really neat because she was going through all the 3D maps and all the tweaks and it was beautiful. She was, you, know, you could tell she was having fun. And then what I'll do many times, I'll put a song on and I'll show that the 3D maps has so, so much common sense to it that you can actually do all six movements to a song. And it looks pretty cool because you're in all three planes of motion. See, the, the thing is, you got you, you, you got to have somebody jump on like uh, TikTok now and do that. And yeah. then it'll go viral. And then you'll... <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'll do that. I'll, I might even have Pooh Bear do that. Cause I know uh oh who loves you. And so Pooh Bear might have... Follow to me that. all over the place. Yeah. And so she came up after it. And she was so sweet. She goes, you win. And I go... I'm sorry. I said, I, I didn't know there's a contest here. She goes, no, I've been struggling. She says, you know, I spent a lot of time and money with that other screen, but 
this one makes so much sense. It's, it's functional, it's movement, it's fun. It's what I do. My body did it naturally. Everybody in this room did it naturally. And you could see all the movement deficits. It's easy to see, it's easy to assess. And then she says, plus, if you have a movement screen that you can't dance to, it's probably not functional. And I go, ooh, that's in a brilliant range. So lay on your back once and lift your leg and hold it. Get down on all fours and point like a pointer dog and hold some plastic and see if you can dance to that. It's not a dance. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I thought that was kind of cute. She, she yeah. gave me a big piece of wisdom there. But perfect. So again, um, let's jump into kind of what how you sure. explain the functional movement spectrum, and I'll share my yeah. screen here. And this is this is fun. This is a, a, a spectrum that's 100% based on science. Um, oh, good, you got it right up there, and I can even see it. So I appreciate that. Perfect. Um, can you see it now, Gary? Yeah, yeah well, okay. I got mine here too. So okay, that, that's so, so. Again, this is undeniable science. All of these truths have been out for thousands of years. I wish if I could say Grand Institute was instrumental in coming up with these. Uh, I'm afraid they were here long, long before I had uh, diapers on. And um, and what what we've done at Grand Institute is said, hey, why don't we just spend most of our life just using the truth, developing strategies from the truth, and then our techniques will take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the smartest decision we ever made. If you look at the first three and you look at the spectrum itself on the right hand side, it says functional on the left hand side, it says non-functional. You could say authentic or non-authentic. Um, or you could, plus you can, at the top, you need to put the function. So if it's golf, if it's walking, it's running, if it's uh, picking something off the ground, if it's playing with your grandkids, doesn't matter what it is, it's still context dependent. If it's swimming, it doesn't matter. We have to put it at the top because functional is specific to what we want to function, how we want to do. However, if you're going to say, I'm going to do a global movement uh, assessment on 99% of people, well, then you go, well, what do we do most of the time? We walk, we reach, we lunge, we swing, we lift, we, we move in this three-dimensional space without hanging on to anything, no equipment. So when you look at the environment, it's obvious that the more natural the environment, in other words, the more there's nothing there, the more functional it's going to be. As soon as you throw in a $40,000 piece of Cybex, as soon as you throw in some plastic, as soon as you throw in something to hold on to, as soon as you throw in uh, the Cybex machine, so it does, doesn't matter, um, all of a sudden becomes less natural and unnatural. This next one, gravity and ground reaction force, is huge because when we move, it's gravity and ground reaction force that creates a lot of the movement. And if we don't replicate that in our assessment, in other words, if we're just standing still or trying to hold and we're not using the force of gravity and ground reaction force, we're missing everything. And it's really, it's really, really, really key that if we're talking about upright function, which we are with, with what we call global human movement, that every one of your tests, at least in the screen, should be upright. As soon as you go horizontal, you really got to challenge yourself and say, we already know the muscles don't function that way. The joints don't function that way. The proprioceptors don't function that way. And then you already touched on this brilliantly because massive momentum is everything. Walking is dealing with massive momentum. Reaching, playing golf is massive momentum. Uh, running is massive momentum. Everything we do is in, is in a, what we call a, a dynamic state. And as soon as you say, well, I'm going to hold this and assess it, well, you can do that, but it's not functional because the real question is, how does my body deal with mass and momentum? It's gravity, ground reaction force, and my inability to deal with mass and momentum that causes an ACL tear, causes low back pain, causes my shoulder to get chewed up, causes me not to be able to hit the golf ball well. So we have to take that in consideration. The next ones are what we call the biological truths. We know that all of human movements, three-dimensional, just walking requires extension, internal rotation, ab and adduction, and flexion of the hip. So just the basic foundational thing of walking, if your assessment doesn't look at the maximal range of motion of internal and external rotation, ab and adduction, and flexion, extension of the hip, you've, again, missed 99% of what you, what you want. But not only motion is three-dimensional in the space that we're in, but every joint, we have to look at it three-dimensionally. So my feet have to be assess three-dimensionally, my hips, my thoracic spine, my shoulders. Um, we know the body's a chain reaction. We can't isolate. You can, but it's not functional. At no point do I hit a tennis ball just by moving my shoulder, or do I just kind of 
do a lot of the things are just my hip moves. And we're not saying you can't do it. Uh, we're not saying you're going to die if you do it. We're just simply saying it's not functional. It's not authentic to how the body moves. So it has to be when the foot moves, we should see the hand moving. We should see the head moving. Probably the biggest thing we've learned is the proprioceptors demand the movement. They get stimulated by end range movement. So they want full mobility, full stability in all three planes of motion at every joint. Then they'll turn on the lights in your body and then you'll be more effective and more efficient. You'll be more functional. Some of us learn you could tell muscles what to do. You know, I was taught that I, you could, I could look at the VMO at the knee and make it turn on and I could squeeze my abdominals and make it turn on. And the muscles just laugh because they're not actors, they're reactors. So we don't want to ever tell a muscle, here's what I want you to do. I don't want to tell my glute to contract. I just simply want to watch them move and see how their body naturally does it. The joints are Hey, Gary, Gary, real quickly, uh, on that one, can you can you go a little bit deeper? That, that one, I think, is probably causing a little bit of riff in people's head when you say that sure. the muscles are more reactors than actors. Yeah. Well, here's a great example. Um, uh, years ago, there was a wonderful study done uh, on the transverse abdominis. Um, and what the study was done is they basically stood people up and they had them drive their arms in the sagittal plane and the frontal plane and basically EMG the trunk up. And they realized that people with kind of ongoing back pain were not activating their transverse abdominis, which, okay, you can't deny that. When you look at the method of the study, it was like brilliant. Uh, I probably would have had them move their hands in the transverse plane as well. Uh, but that's a pretty good start. They had the sagittal and frontal plane covered. But so they therefore theorized that, well, people with low back pain, one of the deficits they have is uh, non-engagement of the transverse abdominis. Mm, pretty good, pretty good uh, summary of that study. However, but then they said, instead of saying, I wonder why, or I wonder who turned the abdominals off, or I wonder what motions in your body especially in your hips and your thoracic spine, which that's what the transverse abdominus attaches to, are not mobile that would automatically turn the proprioceptors off that would turn the transverse abdominus off. They miss that part, uh, which is the, the whole reason for it. And what they did is they said, and we're going to lay you down and, and you'll hear me tease and some people don't take it as teasing, but you'll have somebody fart into a blood pressure cuff. <laughs> it's kind of like... <laughs> I'm missing something here. Well, I'm, I'm, we're getting them to kind of we, we grab their transverse abdominis and we're trying to get them to think about pushing their low back down against the blood pressure cuff and really kind of hunkering down almost like farting so they can contract the transverse abdominis. And even Pooh Bear would laugh at that, you know, going, boy, you know, first of all, I hope I don't fart. Uh, and second of all, you know, if this light is not turned on here, I could yell at this light all day long. Come on, abdominis, turn on. Come on, fart into the blood pressure cuff. Somebody over there by the light switch is going to laugh and go, you know, Gary, I would turn the switch on. So what 3D Maps does, what a good assessment does is finds out what motions in the hip, probably a lot in the transverse plane, what motions in the thoracic spine, probably a lot in the transverse plane are limited and therefore are not activating the motion that turns on the transverse abdominis. So we would say we're going to treat the cause by getting the muscles to react because they're all reactors. Uh, and some, some of us have been taught, well, if the muscle's not working, you, you know, have them put a dollar bill between their glutes and tell them to squeeze their glutes or have so, them contract so, their abdominals. Yeah, so, so the way I'm understanding this and is that you might do those tests and you might do the blood pressure fart and cup. And I'm, I'm guilty of doing that for many years. Um, but when I take and I'm moving and I do this, that does it, it even if it's turned on on the cuff and i could maintain a you know a certain pressure during some you know basic leg you know movements lying on the ground you typically when i go upright and i start you know moving and doing this it could very well just not work then well if it does you're you're lucky uh because the motion that inhibited to begin with you haven't treated so if you don't have that yeah. rotation, you may be able to turn it on consciously, yeah. but what turns the muscle on in function, because you're probably, when you go drive, you're not thinking contract abdominals. When, hopefully you're not thinking about that. Unless when you play me again in golf, <laughs> I want you to be thinking about that. Um, because no, it won't. It, there's yeah. zero, the research has proved there's zero carryover, mostly because in function, movement turns on proprioceptors, proprioceptors turn on the muscles. 
in the schematic you just said, you're using the brain as the activation of the Got muscle. It. And then even if you can turn it on, because if people can turn it on, the ability to stand up and then the, the motion that hasn't been there still isn't there. So by the time you get to the car, your abdominals have been turned off again. Yeah. So it's like, and we know that. And, I mean, it's and, a, the, and the then, constant problem of a low back pain. A, a lot of people have taught, been taught to the isolate to integrate concept. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, and just challenging it a little bit of, of just saying, hey, what what is there from a scientific standpoint that says if I isolate something and get it to turn on, that it will then integrate into the chain? Yeah, there's no, I have never, never seen a study. Plus just common sense tells you that, well, I, I love the word isolate and I love the word integrate. Um, where we come from, we use the word integrated isolation and isolated integration. So for example, let's say, let's say I want to integrate the entire core in the abdominals and I have a dumbbell here. And so I go through some transverse plane motion. I go through some frontal plane motion and I go through some sagittal plane motion to turn on the movement, to turn on the proprioceptors, to turn on my abdominals. That's what we call integrated. Everything's integrated. My butt's firing, my quads are firing, my calf's firing, everything else is firing. But if you say, but why don't you isolate the abdominals? I go, okay. What I then do is position myself so then the hips won't lengthen, the hip won't lengthen, my calf, my ankle won't lengthen, my shoulder may not lengthen. And so now I'll just basically do mostly abdominals. I'll go through transverse plane abdominals, frontal plane abdominals. Now other muscles will be functioning, but the abdominals will be functionally isolated. So there's a difference between artificial, not authentic isolation, which that's what we're t talking about, and isolation while integrated. The body wants to be isolated while integrated because that's what happens on the pitch. That's what happens yeah. on the football field. That's what happens at the grocery store. So Got it. that's a good thing to bring up. Beautiful. All right, let's jump back in. Um, I'll go quick. No, uh, you're good. Obviously, the joints are uh, integrated. Uh, we always giggle at this one. Uh, we had a big study done in physical therapy that all of a sudden said, did you know that when the knee moves, the hip moves, so it could be hip weakness that causes knee pain. Well, where I come from, that's called the femur. Um, and so it's kind of giggly. Unless you fracture your femur, anytime I move in three-dimensional space and use, a, use my foot as a driver, my hand as a driver, my eyes as a driver, any dance move in the world, if my knee moves, I can guarantee you my hips are moving because the femur's moving. And believe it or not, the proximal femur, i.e. the hip, is what we call the proximal knee. And the distal knee happens to be the foot. So the joints, we have to understand not only our chain reaction all the way from my nose to my toes, but we have to understand the integration of the joints. One, Perhaps one, the big one is subconscious reaction. Get, get uh, to the, saying, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, but I just want to no. make sure people are able to follow because you're using terms sure. like driver. I know what it means. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Would you, would you just explain when you say using your arms or your, your eyes yeah. or, or something as a driver, what that means? Beautiful. As movement scientists, we want to know what causes movement. So why did that body move? Uh, what drove it to move? So I can take my right hand and rotate it around the corner and I can look down to my left foot and my calcaneus is just everted. And so if I do that motion and I do this and all of a sudden I look down to my subtalar joint, I'm going to ask the subtalar joint, who drove you to move? In other words, who caused you to move? What, what was the driver? Did you decide to move on your own? And the subtalar joint goes, no, Gary just moved his right hand into right rotation. And I go, oh, okay. So the subtalar joint says his right hand was a driver. And I'll go, well, can he use his left hand? Sure, he can do this. Now I went through eversion. Great. Can he use his eyes? Sure. Can he use his right foot as a driver to create that calcane eversion? Sure. He can do a same side rotational lunge. So in the physics of it all, gravity, ground reaction force, the mass and momentum of the body are the, are the drivers externally. Yeah. And internally, our three main drivers, which make all kinds of sense, are feet, hands, and eyes. Yeah. Uh, and then perhaps the biggest driver in we as human beings is what we'll probably talk about in a little bit is behavioral drivers, yep. uh, which have actually, I believe, even more power than gravity, which is gravity is quite powerful. So uh, I appreciate you slowing me down on that. No problem. So the, the task we have people do is a task that they're used to. Take your foot out here, take your hands up there. Hey, I've done that before. I lunged and reached and I grabbed for a coffee cup just this morning. Well, that's what we're doing in our assessment. We're using 
subconscious reaction to get our but what we call what we want to have the body to do we don't say hold this or try to step over that or think about making your leg do that or those are all foreign things to us reaching out for something is something that that's a common thing so we would call that a subconscious reaction and now we get to the specificity those who are athletic trainers out there just giggle go in we were brought up on specificity specific adaptation to impose demands if you want somebody to jump better you better do a lot of components of jumping uh and so immediately athletic trainers are taught don't lay people down don't go artificial don't try to talk to the muscles don't go isolated understand that that body's got to go back and throw a baseball or go back and make a cut or go back and jump therefore the specificity of that activity which we call transformational zones you got to get them into those transformational zones as soon as you possibly can which would be day one and that's why 3d maps is what we would call the six most fundamental foundational vital transformational zones of the human body. And then if I ask a biomechanist, do you want to know how all 66 of the motions, the, do you want the full range of motion or partial? They go, no, I, I need to know full. I need to know what they got. Do you want to know only mobility or stability? You know, we want both. Do you want them both together? Yeah, because it's without together, it's not functional. So I don't want you to lay down and look at mobility. That's not functional mobility. I don't want you to try to push against something and try to tell me that's strength or stability. I want you to have mobility and stability together. And that's why with 3D maps, it's that. And of course, those last three are what you and I would call gold because the last three are those behavioral drivers where if you're doing the right thing, you're going to engage the person. Uh, and if you're putting them in a position of success every step of the way, you're going to be able to encourage them and then, of course, knowing that they have control of their own human destiny and their own ability to move based on you building upon success, you've now empowered them. And that's the real dead giveaway where they leave and go, this makes sense. This is what I do. I feel like I'm going to be able to work in the garden better than I ever could. Thank you so much for helping me. And that's that's what we're after. Beautiful. Now, all of that is kind of looped in high level overview to what you call applied functional science. Is right. Correct. And would you mind just you don't have to go into deep, you know, that's for another sure. another um, podcast, but just there's three drivers of applied functional science. Um, Beautiful. And, and you mentioned one of them, and that's the one I want to kind of spend a little bit of time in. And then we'll go into what you know, what the yeah. assessment looks like. Yeah. It's really cool because when we finally started realizing this, we found that all of science falls into three buckets or three drivers, like you said. You can't say it better than that. And that's what's applied functional science. It's the physical drivers, it's the biological drivers, and it's the behavioral drivers. So it's the physics of it all, it's the biomechanics of it all, and it's the psychology of it all. And that's how our body decides to move or not move or decides what to do or what not to do. It's uh, those three sciences co come in a confluence of a river and you got to look in the river and go, so how can I help this dear person move better? And I have to take in consideration what their environment's doing to them, what their body itself is doing to them, what their heart and spirit are telling them. Got it. And so what I'm hearing too, and, and what I know, and I want you to dive into this is this is an assessment that it's, it's looking at what a person can't do, but it's more looking at what they can do and then pushing off of the, the positives of what they can do to get to some of those things that they can't. But, you know, versus a lot of other assessments, some people hate coming to do them because it's like, oh, you're going to tell me what I can't do today, uh, yeah. as opposed to what can we do and how can we make that even better? Would you mind spending some time talking about that? Because that really is part of the behavioral driver aspect of this. It really is. Well, I, I wish I would have started this years ago, but we didn't really start emphasizing this until about 20 years ago, where we, we, we know that if we build upon success with the human body, we success begets success, where if we would attack things they couldn't do, it'd take us a long time to get it if we ever got it. Yeah. Um, and so years ago, we decided, well, when we assess people, um, we need to find out where they're successful. We want to give them every opportunity to show us what mobility they have, what stability they have, what their chain reaction looks like, what their dynamic balance is, how their body moves, the beauty of the gift that they've been given. Um, and even a Parkinson's patient who's struggling, we're going to look at that giftedness because it's based on what they show us that we're going to build upon to allow them to move better. At the end of the day, you got to really ask yourself, why do I do an assessment? 
you know, and I think one of the reasons is so you can love on the person a little bit. You can encourage them and uplift them. But the real reason is so I know where to start in order to get them to move better. Theoretically, if I'm a movement scientist and I do a movement assessment, my assessment should tell me where to start and what to do next in order to get them instantaneously to move better, turn on more proprioceptors. And so it's like, hmm, that's a that's a pretty good litmus test. If you're if your assessment just doesn't give you that information, it gives you an arbitrary number, an arbitrary color, or an arbitrary planet out in the universe uh, that you can't go, I'm not sure that's going to help me with Susie here today, then uh, you might want to question it. Got it. Got it. So the, the final thing I'd like to go through, um, and obviously everyone, you know, we're talking about the good, bads, and uglies of, of assessment. And, and at the end of the day, it's, it's about how can we find and learn a movement assessment that'll help people move better? Because yep. if you look in, in at the industry and the population of the people that we're training, yeah, people still want to, you know, get lean, but more people want to be able to move better, live longer and live a healthy, happier life, plain and simple. Amen. And the amount of people that you can touch with this is exponentially larger than the than the, the people especially the people that are gonna be able to afford working with trainers and things like that so right um, now all of the 3d maps and all of the stuff that you're talking about you're saying that these six movements one for stability one for mobility really much pretty much take into consideration all the different movements that could possibly happen in assessing that is that correct yeah, yeah again you you end up saying it better than i do um one of the ways that somebody, one of a biomechanist explained it to us after, uh, after she evaluated, she goes, really what you have is the DNA of human movement. And I go, explain that to me. She says, well, you have the building blocks for all movement. So if you have those 66 vital motions that you cover in your six stability movements and six mobility movements, all those movements, when you combine, allow us to do everything that the body wants to do. So just like the DNA in our cells allows us to be who we are, the DNA of our human movement allows us to move the way we move. And so I thought, wow, that's, that, I'm going to steal that. Uh, you know, I, yeah. and she goes, well, you don't have to steal it. It just makes sense that if I'm going to assess somebody, I want to know the DNA of their human movement because now I can take them anywhere I want to go uh, because I know what, what components of movement they have. And then, what we, what we simply do then is take 3D maps and if we want it to smell and look a little more like running, we tweak it a little towards running or a little more towards golf or throwing a baseball or jumping or uh, reaching down and lifting things off the floor. Or if you tell us what, now that we already have those 66 motions covered of mobility and stability, then just e easily combining them all of a sudden allows us to go wherever we want to go. Uh, and that's why we think within, I, be I believe within the next three to five years, if you're going to call yourself any type of movement scientist, whether you're a personal trainer, athletic trainer, strength coach, physical therapist, chiropractor, doesn't matter. I think you're going to have to be able to evaluate the DNA of human movement. I think it's just going to be like powerful. Oh, that's 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 the basics. So that, that's just it sounds like kind of silly, but no, I, that, that makes sense, especially if I want to get the person to move better. Got it. So let's, uh, you know, I'd love for you to just show a couple of these movements. Obviously, there's, there's, it, it's not a lot. I mean, it, it's, it's daunting when you say 66 different movements and this, um, but when you really comes down to it, it's, it's basically six movements on each, right. like really each side, um, and then yep. looking at it from a mobility and stability standpoint. So I'll pop yeah. this up so people can see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a the, pretty good. That's a, that chart is cool because it goes through the plane by plane of the uh, six chains. Yep. And we have an anterior and a posterior chain in the sagittal plane, the same side lateral, opposite side lateral on the frontal plane, and the same side and opposite side rotation on the transverse plane. And, and here's where I usually confuse people, including myself. The word movement is when the body globally does something. And that's what those six movements are. You, you're lunging and you're reaching your hand somewhere uh, and exposes what we wanted to expose, maximum mobility, maximum stability motions are the things that happen at a joint. So if I do with the anterior chain, um, you can still show the chart, but I'll go ahead and stand up in case you fire it back. And, and those that are listening only, obviously, if you go to the YouTube page, you'll be able to see these charts uh, and you'll be able to see this uh, on the podcast yeah. as well. I appreciate that. So if I, if I do a, a left foot anterior lunge and bilateral hand, posture overhead reach, immediately you can see that's creating maximal hip extension. Why? Because do I know that? Because my heel comes off the ground and that's what brings the heel off the ground. Well, I need to know that in everybody. 
Um, and so this is a movement, a global movement, but my right hip just went through extension, it went through internal rotation, it went through abduction. Right now, just because it's the anterior chain, I'm only interested in extension. When I do the posterior chain, I'm interested in flexion. When I do the same side lateral chain, I'm interested in abduction. When I'm the opposite side lateral, I'm looking at adduction. When I do my same side rotation, I'm looking at external rotation. And when I do opposite side rotation, I'm looking at internal rotation. Question, what else can the hip do? Nothing. The only thing you can do is take that DNA, those building blocks and combine them, which we do with golf, for example. So in golf, when I take my club back, I get a little bit of flexion. I also get some adduction and I get some internal rotation. So probably in 3D maps for golf, we would then do it, do that same opposite side rotational lunge, which combines those. Instead of taking the hands horizontal, we take it and all of a sudden it looks like golf. And so if I did this as part of my movement screen, you'd go, wait a minute, that's golf. And I'd go, yep, transformational zone of golf. If I all of a sudden did something where I did my anterior lunge to a posterior lunge, and then I did took those building blocks of that anterior and posterior chain and just changed my hands a little bit, you go, wait a minute, you're walking, or if you go a little faster, you're starting to run. Yep. 3D mats for running. So everything comes from the foundation of those six movements and those 66 building block motions that I can take the body anywhere I want and understand what it needs and understand even more importantly, as you said, the success of that body so I know exactly what to do to give them more success. Um, the biggest thing I want to do is I want them to improve in a short period of time. I want to look them dead in the eye and just tell them I'm proud of them. That's, that's my big goal with 3D maps. And, and again, to, to, to piggyback on that is what you're saying, too, is through doing these movements and then obviously some, some simple protocols to go along with how you could improve that movement even better, you're, you're taking them in a very short period of time and getting them to move better and see the difference right away, which obviously is a selling point is uh, this person knows what the heck they're talking about. And, right. you know, then they become a client and they love you um, for the rest of your life. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think you, that's pretty uh, you powerful. You have for, as we would say, a lifetime. Yeah, perfect. Well, Gary, this has been fantastic. And, and before I go to one other thing is, is obviously there's some learning that needs to be had in being able to not only perform this assessment, but then know what to look for. And obviously that's what the 3D maps course is all about. And, you know, into the future, potentially some stuff that, you know, will be able to take your eye and improve it through, you know, maybe some uh, camera analysis and things like that. But uh, that's for another, sure. another time and a later date. So, um, but what would you say, you know, again, hopefully some, you know, most of you stay through the podcast and, and, and listen to this or, or watch it on the YouTube channel, but, what would you say to the trainer of, okay, obviously I'm going to sign up. I, you know, I could sign up for this 3d maps course. How long, you know, should it take, you know, and it's a bit of learning, but what would you say to that person who's kind of got maybe a little bit of angst? I used to do these other assessments. Now you're telling me they're not as powerful as they potentially, you know, can be and should be, uh, when we're looking at movement, uh, what would you say to those people? Well, uh, what I found out about personal trainers is they have what I call a selfie selflessness. And what I mean by that is most trainers want themselves to be healthy so they can impart health on other people. Um, and so my recommendation is to take 3D maps initially for yourself only. Be very selfish. Uh, because if you just did 3D maps every morning, and if somebody told me in less than three minutes, I could activate every joint in my body, every muscle in my body, every proprioceptor in my body, mobility and stability wise, I'd go, I'm in. And oh, by the way, the test is the exercise, the exercise is the test. Oh, that by chance happens to be our test too. Well, that makes brilliant sense. So when you first get into 3D maps and we just teach you those six movements, within the first hour, you're going, well, I'm gonna do this for the rest of my life. Uh, well, of course you are, because you're gonna move better and you know, you're gonna, do whatever you want better because your DNA of human human movement, your building blocks will get better. Uh, and then you'll quickly say that, well, this is so easy to do that any of my clients can do it. I can ha have an 85 year old, she might have to hang onto the wall or I might have to hang onto her hands, that's okay. Or she might have to be by a walker, that's, you know, but I, I'm gonna see where she's gifted and I'm gonna give her a quality life for the next 10, 15 years. That's my goal for her. And, and then that selfishness turns into selflessness because you realize, man, this is so much fun. 
And people have so much fun with this that I can just, as, I, as we say, love on people. Just let me see how you move. Wow, that's good. That side to side, that thing we call the frontal plane, that was awesome, Jason. You know, and look at that. Look how much better you're in the transverse plane already. Man, that hip extension, no wonder your low back pain's gone away. You got some more hip extension there. And, uh, you know, I don't want to show you too much, Jason, because you're already out driving me. So we might have to temper this a little <laughs> bit. So it, it just becomes, um, we kind of have a guarantee. It's, it's kind of an unwritten guarantee. But if you go through 3D maps and it doesn't make total sense to you, and it's not 100% different than anything else out there, all you got to do is call me and say, I, I, think you, I think you snookered me and uh, you'll get your money back. But you oh. got to call me and tell me why. You got to make yeah. some, a little bit of sense. And uh, so far, because it's not built upon my thoughts and my uh, lack of wisdom and my mistakes that I've made for 45 years, it's built on pure science. And so that's why, even though we could invite other people to be part of the podcast and go through what you do versus what we do, the problem is I'll be asking them why they decided to do what they did, but they're going to have to say, why did science decide for you to do what you did? And you're not going to win against Newton. It's just not going to happen. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well, man, thank you so much. And I'll, I'll put the links in the uh, show notes and, you know, uh, maybe we could work out some stuff for the lifetime crew as well. Uh, I'm trying to get, you know, many people going through it. So, uh, yeah. I really appreciate it, Gary, as always, uh, amazing, amazing stuff. Um, humble as always and uh you know look forward to many many more conversations and and working together in the future man well your strength is your uh, uh confident uh humility uh and that's why i think you learn so rapidly and that's why i can learn from you and that's why i think these uh training talks have been so effective all the ones you've done uh Thank at least you. the number of ones that i've listened to that you bring out the information that people want to hear and need to hear uh, in order to transform the lives of others and selfishly that's what we want to do we just want to yep. you know leave this earth knowing that we maybe impacted a few lives on the way and you certainly impact thousands and thousands of life and lives and so thank you for the opportunity just to share together no i appreciate it thank you so much gary